Welcome back to The Debrief, this time talking about Cronge and the highlight, Say It Ain't Suh, she's back. The hype train, toot toot, leaving the station all over again. I had like thrown it under the bus at the World Championships, but I'm back. Uh, Chai and Suh, story of the year. Winning another, winning three out of four, and her only non-win was a silver. Not even Yanya pulled that off in her first season. That's my big takeaway from this. Um, yeah, I don't know. I had a great time watching it. That was the cherry on the cake, although it's a pretty not super exciting women's final. But um, yeah, Shyhan is back. Yeah, we talked about we talked about this a little off air right before we started here. I was pleasantly I, I love this competition, too. I really had a great time watching it. Some fantastic route setting, particularly in Some. the men's. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And but I was pleasantly surprised that there were so many big name top stars at this event because since we've had the world championships and we've had this first batch of Olympic births, I was wondering whether some of them would just say peace out to the rest of the world cup lead season. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and just, I don't know, like <laughs> enjoy the Olympic revelry for a couple months and then get serious about their Olympic training. Um, or more serious, I suppose. But that was not the case. We, you know, Yanya was here. Sean McCall was here. A lot of these these names that have already qualified provisionally, I guess, for the Olympics, uh, were still here. So it was great. Yeah, I think who are the people that didn't? So like uh, Akio Tomoa. I don't think Alex Magos was there. So you were seeing some people not show up. So I don't think Sha Shauna was there, or at least they didn't mention her there. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. Don't yeah. Believe she was yeah, there, I don't. So. I don't know if she has a reason to do any more lead climbing until yeah. until like Tokyo. Um, yeah, but you're totally right. The field was uh, good enough that we had uh, a really good event. Like the climbing was uh, was exciting all the way to the end, um, and it it certainly could have been different. Um, but yeah, it was a good. Let me pull up the the results and. And I'll talk about this. I guess we'll talk about the women. They climbed first. But uh, yeah, so like I said, your winner, the unstoppable top climber to ever exist, Chai and So, uh, followed by Jessica Pills, finally back on the podium after a really rough season so far, not seeing very much of her. And then uh, Luchka Rakovic takes third. So the Slovenian home crowd had something to cheer about, even though Yanya Garnbrett couldn't even make finals. Uh, Luchka gave them something to clap at and she actually came out uh, first in semis so she was the last climber on the wall I guess you could think it was a big opportunity for maybe an upset win but uh, and she got close but a bit of a bottleneck in the women's climb that we'll talk about later and then Anna Verhoeven actually doing pretty well considering that she's got that chronic uh, arm injury going on I'm Mori Natsumi Hirano, Mia Krample, Meikotaki all getting wrecked down at the 20th hold uh, yep. too bad but hey, whatever. Basically, basically two different holds is where everybody fell in this entire final. Yeah, and we'll get into that in just a sec. But I think for me, though, I, you, you kind of said that the big headline, in your opinion, was Cheon winning again for the third time in the row. I think that that's certainly a big headline. But I would maybe argue that uh, or I would think, in my opinion, maybe the, the bigger headline was that Yanya did not make the finals sure. again for the second time this season. And the reason I think that that's maybe a little bit bigger of a headline is because we had seen Cheon win. We'd seen her win again. And so we kind of knew she was, it could certainly happen. We knew she was capable of it. Whereas Yanya not making a finals for, a, for the lead season, it had happened once before, but any, you know, anytime something like that happens once you can kind of chalk it up to just a fluke. Uh, but here it, it happened again. And, extra surprising was that it happened right on the heels of the world right after the world championship where she looked so dominant and you and I when we did the debrief of those world championships we talked about how Yanya had had a maybe a rough start to the lead season but she seemed to be back on track right it was mm -hmm. kind of like the Yanya of old and then here she struggles again once the world cup season uh, starts up again I don't know I don't know what it is. For whatever reason, this lead season seems to have some kryptonite for for Yanya. Um, it, it's just uh, so uh, just to me that was kind of the bigger shock was that Yanya didn't even make finals in her home country too. Um, yet again, that was shocking to me. Well, like can't you can't you paint the picture of? You know, so for the for the earlier comps, the fact that they had just come out of a bouldering season where she was incredibly dominant and, 
you know, you, you didn't even have time to recondition for lead climbing. Like bouldering is finished, boom, you're right into lead climbing. And that was kind of rationale we gave for Yanya's uh, disappointing uh, results in, what was it, Chamonix? I can't even remember what comp that was. Chamonix, yeah, Chamonix, she finished ninth. Uh, which, by the way, at that point was her lowest ever finish in a World Cup, not counting speed. Um, but now I think the, like, uh, Charlie posted his, his recap, uh, and he mentioned that he felt it was a, a pressure thing that he had been talking to her. She felt kind of off her game and it's a home field kind of thing. So all the crowd is on you. Um, and that, I think that's, that's reasonable. Like we, we've talked about that with Akio all the time where it seems like she can't quite get her form together whenever she's climbing in Japan. It always seems like those are her most disappointing results. So I feel like we can still paint like a rational picture. It's, I don't want to say it's like that something's happening in 2019, although maybe, but I feel like there are still good reasons that we can at least kind of project um, for why these things are happening. But it, like that said, she finished 13th. That's her worst ever result in, in a, in a lead world cup. That's an unbelievable level. Like that's so, can you, can you imagine saying, yeah, okay. In my entire lead career, the worst yeah. I've ever done is 13th. You make semis every time. That's yeah, so that's, nuts. Yeah, it's something we always have to remember that sort of caveat whenever we're talking about Yanya. When you say something like she had a terrible performance, it's by yeah. Yanya standards. It's by <laughs> she this didn't come kind of first. Legendary yeah. level. Yeah. yeah. So terrible for Yanya is still uh, advancing to semifinals and and finishing in the middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. uh, but you bring up an interesting point, too, that Yanya went straight from the phenomenal bouldering season to the lead season, which is not something that Cheyun So had to do, right? Cheyun yep. So was not uh, participating in the bouldering season. So I think there might be really something to that when you say that Yanya um, maybe is feeling the pressure, feeling the burnout. Who knows? I, I just think that, that all that would be a little easier to stomach if she hadn't just a few weeks ago proven to us that she can get it done at the world cup or at the world championships right sure. like she she had such a phenomenal performance there in 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 the various disciplines um which is if she had struggled there i think it would be i would be more likely to subscribe to that thinking of yeah maybe she's burned out or maybe she's feeling the pressure whatever sure but um, she she proved that she was as good as ever just a couple weeks ago and then once the lead season the world cup season starts up again uh these stumbles so um we'll see it'll be an interesting you know next couple of competitions to see what happens and and uh because yanya all of a sudden she kind of finds herself in a real hole in terms of the overall lead uh season scores right yes. she i mean cheon has won she's not winning she's not winning the season the likelihood is so low it's nuts yeah and think about cheon she's won three gold medals and she i think the, the other was a silver well, the other was a silver, and yeah. and at the end of the lead season, they drop your worst, a competitor's worst performance, which yeah. right now, Chanso's worst is a silver, so yeah. that's a pretty darn good position to be yeah, in. Yeah, what, what I have heard from 8A.NU is that uh, so long as, I gotta get my words together, so long as uh, Chayan manages an eighth place or better in either of the upcoming comps in Xiamen or Inzai, she is locked down the uh, the lead uh, World Cup season. So that's like that's gonna be a hard thing to deny her. You would think so, but you you never know. Stranger things have happened. And, sure. Uh, oh yeah, totally. So, but I, it just yeah. seems so unlikely, given that her performances this year are again three firsts and a second. Yeah. Like that's it would be pretty uh, pretty unlikely and and again that's just to guarantee her right if anybody else falls apart or doesn't have quite the good she can still cruise right to uh, right into first place so yeah and, and the the next the, the next um, competitions are in Asia a little close to home for her there aren't there aren't any in South Korea but um, but uh, nonetheless we'll see if that impacts Cheon's performance at all just like a you know a little less jet lag and all sure. that stuff yeah so. no absolutely um let's uh while we're talking about the women let's talk about this uh this final i'm just gonna yeah. run the run the video of this final this is gonna take us a little while to get through we were talking about the root setting how there was some really good root setting this weekend that was mostly on the men's side of the final for the women's final it was kind of a slow climbing uh lots of tension especially once you get up out of this little steep roof section here a lot of slopey holds and taking your time um, on this wall in general, we saw a bunch of timeouts. I think there was a critical one in semifinals. Yes. Uh, I can't remember who that was. Um, but Chayun's crushing through this, making it look excellent. 
Um, but once we get up into the roof section, we get to this, uh, this section that again was basically the end of the road for the top four climbers. Uh, and we're getting up on it here. But yeah, as you can see, old school wall. Yeah, this was really neat to see this wall because you'll notice that it has all this, the, the panels of it have all this sculpting and the little grooves and undulations. That's not something that you see on, on most, I don't know, modern walls, for lack of a better word, where no, it's yeah. just kind of a grit uh, sort of plane and you, and you can smear on it. But on this wall, you actually saw the competitors really working to find the footholds and the handholds on the undulations of the panels sometimes. You can see there's chalk kind of there on the on the beige uh, little grooves and stuff. So that was kind of neat. That's not something we normally see. Uh, yeah. it, competitors working really meticulously to find the holds that are on the panels. Um, and for any fans of old school, you just sort of the history, it's it's always neat to see them climbing on these walls from yeah. the mid nineties, I guess. And just cause we're at it, this is basically where it all came down to for the women. 33, 34 is that pocket. And interestingly, this top volume, there's those two red volumes kind of stacked side by side that uh, the Cheyenne's just beneath. The top one apparently didn't have a score by the root setters, so it became a 0.5. So this is yep. 34, this is 34.5, and then that's the 34.5 plus, just to make things confusing, right? Well, <laughs> well let, maybe we should take a second and explain the what is meant by the plus as opposed to the 0.5. I know they yeah. said this on the broadcast, but it is pretty confusing. It's not something that we normally see in the scores. It's very rare that you get a 0.5. Mm -hmm. um, so as Charlie explained, and from what I gathered, I haven't looked at the actual phrasing of the, the rules, but the 0.5 is given if they use a hold that's not intended to be a scored handhold. Um, so the obvious example that I can think of would be like if there was a, a, a handhold and then there was another handhold, but in between them there was maybe like a foot jib yes. or something. Um, and they and instead of going directly to the next handhold, they would they use that jib um, as with their hand. That would give them the point five. Now in this case, there was not a jib. Instead, it was that big volume that you pointed out um, that wasn't intended to be a, a hold, a handhold, and yet you saw a number of competitors. Um, kind of reach for it and in the case of Cheon actually actually use it for um for some kind of positive movement so yeah so you can see Cheyenne's hand uh, right hand on the top of that volume so that was the 0.5 the uh, scoring there's a little chip to the right of her shoulder that was uh 33 her left hand is on 34 which is a little uh, like two or three finger pocket and 35 i'm not sure if 35 is the boomerang on the left or the crimp pinch above her uh it might not matter either way so long as you're going to one of them uh, you're probably going to get your plus or they could both be considered 35. we saw these women going both ways and earning the plus which seems to mean that the root setters are okay in either direction generally you won't get a plus if you're not moving towards the uh, the direction of the climb. So if you're like, let's say, like if you look at Chai Hun on this wall here, if she dynamically throws herself to the right side of the screen going backwards, she's not going to earn a plus, right? She's not moving in the direction of the climb. Yeah. So Chai Hun threw to the left, that earned her the 34.5 plus. Um, but if we look at the other women, I'm just going to go back. So I've got the top four women here. So first of all, Anik Verhoeven came in fourth. Uh, she had the exact same score in finals as Luch Karakovic of 34. Um, or was it 34 plus? Sorry, I gotta, I gotta get my. Oh, I can check together. my. Let's see here. I, I got can it check right here. Scores. Uh, yeah, 34 plus. Sorry. So this is Anik Verhoven. Her left hand is on 34, and then she threw to the left to that boomerang, and that got her a 34 plus. Luch Karakovic got the exact same score of 34 plus, although she did it differently. Her left hand again is on 34, but she reaches up to the little pinch that you see in the top of your screen, and that earned her 34 plus. And then Jesse Pills coming in second. She did use the 0.5. So uh, you see her left hand there controlling that volume, which became the 34.5. But her next move was to match her right hand up on that sloper. So she ended up with both hands on the top of that sloper, the so-called 34.5. But she couldn't control it. She slapped it and she slipped right off. So she couldn't proceed off of that sloper. And so she ended up with a score of 34.5 instead of 34.5 plus. 
Scoring sucks in climbing sometimes. Well, it, you, don't, <laughs> you don't normally want to see such a bottleneck, but it did yeah. make you really pay close attention to that section, and it, it did end up being pretty exciting. I mean, you kept wondering if anybody was going to be able to get that 35th hold. Um, it's too bad nobody did it because I was really curious to see what the rest of the route was ab above those, either either of those holds that yeah. could have counted as hold 35. There was still like really a third of the climb above it that didn't get touched, which really is a bummer because the top of it looked pretty cool. Actually, I've got a, we were going to talk, use this for something else, but this is a, an image of the, uh, of the women's climb. And uh, I don't really know how to describe it, but basically that top entire headwall section was unused. Um, we really only had the climbing up until where the wall meets that pillar coming in from the bottom of the screen. So a lot of climbing we didn't get to see. Could have been really exciting. We missed out on it, but uh, that's just how it goes. So yeah, but props oh, well. to the Slovenian TV for using those. Those graphics were nice. You and I. Have, yeah. This has been a drum that you and I have been beating for. For this whole debrief season, uh, all the time we've been doing these is that graphics matter, and um, it's so nice when you have them, just mm -hmm. showing where the route is. That was really neat. Yeah, aside from, and this one was kind of hypnotic because they had those, like, those arrows were moving the entire time, just freaking the hell out of me. Um, but they also had some, and the one uh, disappointment from our side for the English language IFSC stream is that uh, Slovenian TV was piping these images into the IFSC, but uh, they probably weren't coordinating with Charlie and the folks in the IFSC production. So they would put up this, but it was unclear kind of what it was getting at. They did a couple cool graphics where they like circled different holds or different areas of the wall. But again, there was no communication as to when they were going to show that stuff or what they were trying to illustrate. So Charlie had to kind of just sit there and be like, all right, you know, this is stuff they're showing. They're probably talking about it in Slovenian. It's just how yeah. it uh, how it is. Uh, but it could have been could have been really useful. But it's it's uh, at least cool that they're trying it and more people are capable of that. And hopefully the coordination gets to the point where hey, you know, somebody could say hey, we're talking about this hold and why, and this is it on the screen. So yeah, yeah. Um, what else was there about the uh, about the broadcast stuff? One thing I wanted to point out was having those very short like sideline root setter interviews before uh, the climbers started. So as the climbers come out to preview, we see a bit of the wall, we see those graphics. And then one of the, it sounded like she was probably civilian, but she did a short English language interview with uh, Christian Bindhammer, the uh, chief root setter. And again, it was like two questions, right? But it was that kind of nice stuff where, you know, what's your strategy for this event? And he, he actually gave really good answers, which is probably a lot of why he liked it. Um, yeah. or why I liked it. Um, but that was a, a really nice touch and I'm glad he was open to that. And I'm really glad they, they bothered to do that. It's always nice to get in the head of the route setters. It's always nice to see what they were thinking, especially on a route like this, where, like we said, people did not necessarily make it higher. They didn't make it up to the head wall. So it was just kind of interesting to know the overall methodology. Um, the more that these route setters get highlighted, the better because it's, th then you have an educated audience, right? People mm -hmm. understand um, a little behind the scenes, little what goes into making these routes good routes as opposed to not so good routes and all that. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and just adding great. a little bit of context for what to expect in the in the climb that you're about to see and why why things are set the way they are. So yeah, that was a yeah. very cool uh, very cool part of it. Uh, was there anything else you want to talk about the on the women's side? I'm trying to think if there was anything uh, noteworthy, but. No, I don't think so. I, I I mean, it was nice that Slovenia did, even though Yanya didn't make it, there were a couple of Slovenian women in the finals, right? Um, Luchka Rakovic and, and Mia Krampel made it in. Um, Mia's having a pretty solid season, I think, overall. Um, She's showing up she, a lot. She is, yeah, which she ended up in seventh. Uh, not surprising, there was a number of, of Japanese competitors there. Um, and, and I think it was... Um, that's just kind of a continuation of what we've seen this whole season, pretty mm -hmm. much dating back to the bouldering season two circuit. Um, just Japan, Japan and Slovenia, right? Like the the dominant teams this 2019. So. Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about the men then. Uh, men scores Adam Andra comes out on top in his second lead World Cup of the season. Uh, so he's going uh, two for two basically this year, followed by Kai Harada winning his first ever lead World Cup medal, getting the silver. And then also winning their first lead World Cup medal is Alberto Hines Lopez, 
also somebody that I'm like on the hype train of uh, yeah. now. What a cool climber to watch. Sean McCall just barely uh, miss- misses the podium uh, with a 30 plus, followed by Kokoro Fuji, Stefano Gazolfi, who actually had a good climb considering Stefano's had some like brutal low falls. And I mm-hmm. thought he was going to be one of the guys that got wrecked along with Jakob Schubert and Martin Stronach at the 12. Um, that was a cruel. Oh, what's going on here? That was a very cruel little section because for so many of the climbers, it just seemed so easy to get through. It was just a sloper that you pat and get out. But then, like, Jakob Schubert got wrecked on this thing. Yeah, I'm, tr- I'm looking at this. So I think Sean climbed first, Sean McCall climbed first, mm-hmm. and then Kokoro Fuji climbed after him. Um, and I remember when they were going up to that particular sloper, when those two guys were up to I said, oh, that looks like that is going to get really chalky as this sure. round goes on. It, it, We didn't get a side angle of it, so we don't know how much kind of positivity there was to mm-hmm. it, but it did. It just looked like a really slim kind of full pad sloper. And sure enough, as the round went on, people seemed to struggle more and more at that hold. And, and in the case of, of Jakob, he just, I mean, it kind of looked like he, he kind of, hit it wrong maybe he went he hit it with his i'm trying to think he hit it with his left hand and then he went out to the other slopey hold with with his right hand hand. and then it looked like maybe that left hand was just bad enough that you couldn't really correct correct as much these holds right here you see this the left hand circle yeah right obviously looks terrible but adam matched it and got out whereas some of the other guys were putting their right hand on the right volume and that just put you in a bad spot because that thing looked greasy as hell it probably had a bunch of shoe rubber on it no chalk and it's not very positive plus it's far out from where you're going and yeah. Uh, yeah, it was uh, a cruel spot. We also missed there was a little bit of a hand jam down in the earlier section, although it had uh, had uh, crimp inside of it. Uh, but yeah, this was Adam's winning winning attempt. Um, this little donut with the dino to it. Kai Harada had a showstopper moment doing the one hand dino and just right. deciding that that was no problem. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, what did you think about this uh, this this climb? I really liked the route. This section here that Adam's going to was kind of spicy also that that sort of trying that pyramid that he's touching right there it looks like some guys adam didn't struggle with it but some other guys had to almost get like their whole forearm into it to get for real to to be able to show to be stable on it um i i think this was a great performance by adam uncharacteristically we saw him really try to get the crowd into it a number of times which is not that He's done it before, but it's he not must have felt so seen. good, man. Like he was yeah. clearly going into this feeling awesome because I mean he was like leading the pack in every single round, and yeah, twice on this climb he obviously knew that this was going down. And I thought it was really interesting because, as we talked about, he he had that bumble at the World Championships where he you know his foot he weighted the bolt or whatever, so he he didn't qualify for the Olympics. Um, so I think that became a talking point, and it's easy to to think in that discussion and that letdown for his Olympic hopes so far it's easy to think that he hasn't really had that good of a lead season because there's that big <laughs> glaring like disappointment you know of, yeah. the, of the Olympics there but in fact he's he's having a phenomenal lead season um, yeah. and you know he's he's already won prior to this he had won a World Cup competition and then he won the lead discipline at the World Championships and then he won here in pretty dominant fashion he was the only competitor to top the route in the men's or women's finals so um it was it was awesome it was just a it was a kind of vintage Adam Andre here yeah and again one of those Hollywood moments of course just finishing with the last climber out getting the top and uh you know women climbed first so there was the tension of that event or of that uh, round not going so well uh, but the crowd was so behind adam it was unreal he clearly looked like he could top it he finally did and he ended up getting a standing ovation from everybody at uh, at the uh, at the sports hall which was a really cool finish to uh to, to the climb so great yeah. work from adam but it's interesting how you how you talk about how uh how you can feel like he's not having a good lead season. It's so, it's so unusual how my idea of how well people are doing can be based off of a single event, especially people like Yanya or Adam, where you expect them to do well, or expect them to win something or at least qualify. And then one thing happens and it affects your entire view. Um, but when you look at it, like, I mean, he's leading the, the lead World Cup uh, ranking right now, and he's only been to two World Cups and he's won both of them. Uh, yeah. So it's, it is kind of messy how that, how that affects your brain. 
Well, in in boxing, there's this old saying that you're only as good as your last fight. Sure. And and I think that's in fair. competition, that's kind of true too. It's like your that whatever your last result was, that's going to be the thing that sticks in people's mind, uh, for better or worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it's it's just it's easy to think Andre didn't qualify for the Olympics. That was shocking and disappointing. Uh, so it's easy to think like, wow, what what the heck? What's going on with his season? But when you take out that that one fluke incident, really, uh, just sort of stepping on the bolt or whatever it was, it's it's like he's having a, a great season. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, and and you know we should give credit where it's due for the route setting. We re- we sort of railed on the on the women's. How how there was a couple bottlenecks there that was unfortunate. The men's the route setting for that final that route that we just saw was was awesome. Um, because if you look at the scores, it's like the the competitors. It was like twelve plus twenty five plus twenty seven plus thirty plus thirty one point five plus thirty two, and then a top. That was the spread for the various high points of all the competitors, and that's just about as good as as you can ask for in terms of separation. Yeah. yeah, I probably would have felt different if Adam hadn't topped it. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was really good. And you know, it's one of those things where it's, you know, half of whether it's good or not is totally dependent on how good the climbers are that day. So, you know, you half of the, half of the blame almost goes to them. Um, yeah. I, I want to talk about the, the lead world rankings for men right yeah. now. It is up in the air. There's only two more events to go, but Adam is leading with only two events. Um, and what's what I'm curious about is you were talking about how we were kind of surprised that so much of the field showed up, even though a lot of them have an Olympic lock now. Uh, this lead World Cup season for men is wide open. Uh, like so many of these people haven't attended all of the events, so they mm-hmm. still need to attend to get enough points to to like lock in a win. But even the ones that are leading are are on really shaky ground in terms of only having a couple of those uh, spots. Like first place, Andra with two wins uh, and no other results. Alex Migos is second with a third, a second, and a 16th place, right? Sean McCall is in third place right now. He's the only one of the top six climbers in the world ranking right now that's actually attended all four events. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of room for movement, and the last two World Cups are going to absolutely decide who walks away with this season. I think, you know, if Adam shows up to all of them, he's probably going to win it if he keeps up this pace of of winning, you know, all uh, all of the events. But it's open, so why not show up, right? If you're already qualified, like Jakob or like Sean, take the season. Like, why not? I know Sean would take that like in a heartbeat. That's something I think that he uh, he would be looking for again. Um, now that he's kind of back in in what looks like a really good form, I'm sure he's looking for those kind of achievements. And Jakob Schubert, I'm sure, would not turn it down again. He's a super decorated guy. He'll probably take as many more as he can. Yeah, you would think I, I could see both sides of it, I suppose. If a competitor did not want to... If, if, if a competitor qualified for the Olympics already, I could understand why they might want to just take the rest of the lead season off um, to focus on the Olympics. Maybe this would be it. They could take the rest of the summer or the fall here to just refresh mentally, um, rest up in their in their home country, not have to worry about tweaking a finger or some fluke injury uh, in competition or something like that. But at the same time, I can understand why competitors like Sean or, or Jakob would want to stay sharp and and not miss not skip a beat and mm-hmm. stay on the competition circuit. So um, I, I could see both both sides of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk about the so uh, one other like camera thing that I really enjoyed was having a camera in the um, in the call zone hallway. So this is where the athletes sit. As yes. they tie themselves in and wait to be called out for the climb. So there's a couple of really cool moments. Mako Taki being caught totally off guard that it was her time to go. And you saw her like yeah. freak out and start running out. Uh, Sean McCall sticking his hands like out a tiny window crack trying to dry yeah. his hands a little bit. Uh, Veteran Adam, savvy. Yeah. Adam just being pensive. I, I thought the Sean McCall thing. I was trying to think of like how could I use this picture as a meme. Something about it. I was like, I don't know. Uh, it's just a Canadian thing. You find pictures of Sean McCall and you want to turn it into a joke somehow. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, that was a, a really nice touch and it added so it much was. character. But the best one, and I'm not sure if you could get away with it in North America because I feel like it would people would flame you on Twitter for it, was as uh, as Alberto 
Ines Lopez was in the hall getting ready to come out. The DJ throws on like the classic like matador like trumpet call, right? Like it's the we talked about uh, like national musical identities back many episodes yes. ago of yeah. what music would we play at our World Cups. And uh, it was great because that comes on and it's obviously like a joke, which could possibly be borderline. Um, but he's laughing along with it and comes out and gives such a great performance. I thought that was such a, a like a a character building moment, like a brand building moment of, of who this person is. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Let's just take a second on the uh, kind of jumping off of that to talk about Alberto Hines Lopez and his, his rise this season. He is so fun to watch. And I think it's because Charlie Bosco mentioned this on commentary. He, he wears the grit and the emotion and the challenge of every single move on his face. He's such an expressive climber. Um, and, and I think Charlie put it, put it very well when he said something like he, he, he fights for, for one hold and he focuses kind of a hundred percent on that hold. And then if he gets it, he'll, he'll worry about fighting for the next one. And then if yeah. he gets it, it's, it's just, he's, he's a, he's so fun to watch. Um, almost like because he, his style is, is kind of the opposite of, of like a flowy flowing style right and i don't mm -hmm. mean i mean that in the best sense it's like he's just he he fights for every move and it just makes it really exciting um he, he he's great and he's and he's he, on top of that probably most importantly he's really good and we mm -hmm. we're kind of witnessing his his rise uh, as a as a young guy on the adult scene here so it's it's great it's cool to see because we've we've been looking at all of these young women coming up uh the the particular 2003 cohort for women has been nuts with Chaiyun and uh, Natsuki and Aimori and all these people. Uh, but we didn't see as much as that with the men. So so even though Alberto is a year older than them, born in 2002, so last year was his first year of eligibility. It's really cool to see some of that being added into the scene. And I loved seeing the moments of, of him being on the podium talking to Adam uh, and him sitting with Sean McCall and those guys. Like It felt like finally there was some some new blood being in there and we see it every once in a while but i really like that dynamic i think that's super cool and i think mm -hmm. i like having the opportunity for the older athletes to support and and almost mentor somebody coming up uh but also have that young guy saying hey you guys can't just sit around forever right like i'm coming for you i want these medals and uh you guys have been here too long so get the fuck out i'm yeah. here now so that was really uh really neat yeah, it was great. And and he's consistent too. It's mm -hmm. not this one-off thing. We've seen him perform well in a number of competitions to the point now where it's 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 not surprising to see him in the finals. And yeah. that's uh that's that's pretty remarkable. You know, you we've seen it a couple times in this season so far where you have one of those youngsters kind of make it uh in one finals, but then it's not something that they keep up for for multiple finals. But uh but he's yeah, he's he's consistent, so it's great. I'm just trying to find when the last time a Spanish climber won a medal. Because Spain used to, especially in lead climbing, Spain was so incredibly dominant having mm -hmm. that while well, still on the scene or did he retire ramon julian Pujblanc, like he was a dominant climber but also adu marin and patchy and um the third one's escaping my head right now danny andrada like oh, all sure. these guys right and of course they had that podium sweep that i featured in one of the like trivia things on instagram um okay the last time yeah last time spain won a world cup medal was 2015 and that was ramon winning a bronze in purse uh yeah. for lead so who knows? Maybe this is part of the resurgence of Spanish climbing. Yeah, it's been uh, what four years or something. So that's yeah. um, that's certainly and and uh, it goes without saying that Alberto is is of course like a whole totally different generation than all those guys that mm -hmm. we just mentioned. So um, Do you yeah, know those uh, you know those maps where they like they it's usually Europe and they just draw a line in different spots and they're like there's this kind of Europe and this kind of Europe and so like mm -hmm. it's like cold Europe and hot Europe and like potato Europe and tomato Europe kind of thing. Yeah, I feel yeah. like all of all of the good European climbers are like from the from the relatively you know, like boiled chicken and potatoes end of end of the continent. We don't see many like really, really like top level Italians or like those romance languages, right? Like, so it'd be mm -hmm. sick if we get those super passionate climbers from Spain and Italy adding some yeah. like fire to this shit. I'd love that stuff. That'd it be awesome. it would. And, and we've seen a couple of uh, a couple of Italians. It, it, yeah, maybe we're kind of witnessing something like that, sort of a, a shift. That'd be that'd be really exciting. 
bring it on. I love it. Yeah. Bring it on. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's this one. I came out with like relatively few notes. I'll, I let me be think. Um, We're only let like me th- thirty well, minutes into this somehow. Well, but. I could I could go over. Um, I'll go over the Americans because we haven't really touched on the Team USA. Uh, so the I, I I wrote it when I was writing up the recap for this event. I said if if the event would stop at the after the qualification rounds, Team USA <laughs> had a phenomenal and a really uh, pretty impressive showing because uh, they had four. Uh, Team USA had four members that advanced into the uh, into the semifinals. They had Sean Bailey and Jesse Gruper in the men's division, and Kyra Condi and Ashima Shirishi in the uh, women's division. So um, Sean Bailey ended up 14th in the scores. Jesse Gruper ended up 24th. Kyra Condi ended up uh, 14th, which was actually she said on Instagram that was her highest lead uh, placement ever. So that's cool. kind of a silver lining there. That's cool. And then Ashima was 16th. Um, rounding out kind of farther down was uh, John Brosler was 70th in the men's. Um, Alex Johnson was in her first lead World Cup uh, since two- 2012, so it was kind of cool to see her <laughs> taking part. Um, she got 40th. Maggie Hammer was 48th, and Estelle Park, who is not a name that we've talked about. She's a youth. Uh, she's she's came- an Ontario mainstay, baby. She like lives. I don't know if where she lives, but she's in Ontario all the time. See her yeah, all the time. Crushing I, locals. I. I, I I Wait, was Estelle Park at this? She got 50th. Holy yeah. shit, I and had no she, idea. Um, I thought she came from First Ascent or near Chicago, that youth team. But yeah, I so I, I know her as a Chicago kid, but she ends up okay. climbing in a bunch of Ontario yeah. comps sometimes. And it was funny, Maggie Hammer, I swear to God, she was in Youth D like yesterday. Yeah. If I remember, she's in Michigan because I remember she has an older brother that did a lot of speed. Is that yep. Max Hammer? Yep. Amazing yep, name, right. obviously. Max Hammer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, and Maggie Hammer, they're both uh, yeah crushers on the youth the youth scene. I know their I know their names and their accomplishments really well because that's kind of the same youth circuit that I'm a part of with coaching. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's the tail of the tape. Not the not the um, not uh, the American names that maybe people have have come to expect uh, on the whole for for this season. There was no um, Margot Hayes. There was no. Um, Brooke Rabatou wasn't there. There was no Drew Ruana, who's a name that we've heard, mm-hmm. was not there. Um, who else? Um, Zach Gala, for example. So, but um, anyway, that's uh, those are the results for the Americans. So. Uh, results for Canadians. Uh, Sean yeah. McCall came fourth, and uh, that's pretty much it. Well, he. Yep. Let's talk. Let's <laughs> take a minute, minute to just talk about Sean McCall. We've talked about this on other episodes, but I am just. Every it feels like every competition. I'm just impressed with the resurgence that he has had, because I am as guilty as anyone. I, I've always I've always been a fan of Sean McCall, but at some point a couple years ago, you sort you have to as a fan you have to sort of kind of like face the music and start wondering if he's if he, if he's over the I don't know what you'd call it over the hill for yeah, competition sure. performance and stuff, um, and his results kind of spoke to that these past couple years and then all of a sudden this year i mean he he missed he barely missed a podium here um mm-hmm. so it's just uh it's it's awesome it's he's just having one heck of a season on top of the earning the olympic berth and stuff so yeah uh yeah it's you know i was also critical of all of that stuff and i've been i've been painting that kind of story or telling that story painting that picture uh for a bit that it seemed like he was on the on kind of a downhill uh trajectory but you can't really argue with this season right um and i think also part of me turning 30 is i'm like ah 30 is not that old he can probably like keep doing it for a while now that i'm confronting that age myself uh but no he's had an excellent season the olympics thing i still like part of it I find like a lot of things went his way, obviously, to in term like, I mean, Adam stepping on the bolt, uh, some of the competitors going through being dominantly speed climbers for a couple of them, like just things like that, that just you honestly were kind of fluky. Um, but when you look at the rest of the field, you say, yeah, Toulouse would have probably been very likely, whereas before, actually at the start of the season, before things started, I would have given him less than a 50% chance of, uh, of making it through just based on his previous form, like not based on numbers or anything, but just looking at the field and people that have previously competed and combined. I, I thought if you just keep projecting where he's at, I thought he was on the downward uh, swing. That said, all of his coaches disagreed. Anytime I talked to the the national uh, head coach in Canada, uh, he was very optimistic, which I would 
expect, but mm-hmm. everybody a lot of faith that Sean was going to perform really well this season, and it uh, it's proven to be true. So I can't argue yeah. with that, and that's that's probably. I hope you know. I I don't know how much attention Sean pays to like what people think of his career. I imagine it's something that athletes think about, especially somebody like him who's in the spotlight. I'm sure he's aware that there are a lot of people doubting him, me included. And I hope he gets a lot of pleasure out of the fact that he is proving that wrong because he deserves it. You know, Um, I think it would be normal for people around this age to to start considering packing it in. And he's decided, no, I'm going to gear it up. So props to him. Yeah, and and on that note, that reminds me that we could talk about um, another veteran, uh, J- Jane Kim. Jane Kim, um, sure. who w- is also somebody that these last couple years, y- you started to wonder, like, is she going to retire soon? You know, um, she returned at this competition after being out for a number of competitions because of an injury um, was that the first comp of the year where she had that uh finger or wrist thing like it was really early this season she had to bail right it might have been yeah, the very first comp. i think it was the first um the first event if i remember correctly um and it's it, it set her set her off off course she she wasn't at the previous competitions and at this competition it looked like her finger was still heavily taped mm-hmm. um but she did she did come back now was she I'm trying to remember, was she completely absent from the world championships? No, she was still there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she still did that stuff. Um, right. So so this was her return to World Cup competition. It wasn't yeah. necessarily her, her return. She'd already returned. Yeah, she didn't have a successful world championship. It didn't, uh, didn't she, nowhere did she end up in the top 20 of any discipline, which is uh, too bad. But I mean, she honestly, she was probably playing it cautious and hoping things would go her way which i think is totally reasonable because if things do go your way like take it take that bite of the olympics just go for it well um, and she's gonna have an uphill battle i'm i'm the the biggest giant kim fan that there is because I, I lived in korea and i i witnessed what a celebrity she is over there what all that she's done for the korean climbing scene but being a realist she's gonna have a hard time qualifying for the combined format because she's such a her style is so slow and methodical by nature that having to participate in speed climbing is just um i I don't know it's almost it almost seems cruel because it's 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 like jayin kim is not meant to be a fast climber that's not that's just that's she's she's great because she's so slow and methodical so (laughs) sure so it it, uh she's gonna she's got an uphill battle with the combined format um so I, i wasn't as surprised especially just since she had just come off the injury i wasn't as surprised that she struggled in the combined format at the world championships um but i am i i don't want to say surprised she she almost made finals right i think she finished in ninth place here at this competition and um so not not the top of the pack that we've kind of come to expect from giant kim but mm-hmm. um one can expect that you know she's probably still healing and getting her groove back and stuff like that so yeah just looking at the uh, combined rankings right now she's ranked as 31st uh after actually i should see if it has been refreshed or not um from uh from this last thing. But anyway, she's ranked 31st. She already has all of her, like she's got two scores in lead speed and bouldering. So if, uh, if you take away the seven that have already qualified, um, like she's not currently in, but she could certainly squeak in. Let's say she has a couple good lead comps at the last two events of the season. She could qualify for Toulouse. And if she qualifies for Toulouse, then, then I'd say things could work out again. Like these are really fluky qualifying events, man. It's like individual climbs. You just hope they go their way. Uh, But like we talked about, the interesting thing is when you're going to get down to the, uh, the uh, Asian continental championships, because we could live in a world where your, your like top two prospects for that are Jane Kim and Cheyenne. So right. Assuming the Japanese climbers aren't going to use that as a selection event. If they decline those invites, then I would say those could be your top two seeds right there. I don't think there's any Chinese climbers that uh, come to mind as being better at the moment. So that well, could be a very intriguing uh, uh, prospect. It could. But, and let's throw Sol Sa into the mix too, who is, oh, sure. um, who is sort of statistically a better combined mm-hmm. performer than than Jane Kim or Chan So, I think. I mean, because Sol Sa has done pretty well at speed climbing. Um, so, I, I think that's going to be, that's an interesting trifecta, those three women, um, when you're talking about if, if any, if, if two of them would earn Olympic berths, which granted, that's 
by no means a guarantee. But if two of them would give the Olympic get the Olympic invitation, who's going to be that third one out? Um, that's hard to that's hard to predict. Yeah, you're totally right. I overlooked that. I also overlooked uh, Yutong Zhang because I didn't see yeah. her name at all this weekend. Uh, but that's another one. So Yutong and then the three Korean women. I'm not sure. Do you know if I don't know this for sure? So we don't have to speculate. But I'm trying to remember if Indonesia is considered part of Asia or part of Oceania. Because I'm not sure which event, because then Eri Susanti Raheyu is also one of the people that would be in the running um, for it. Um, if it's I Oceania, yeah. I think that would like I think that would be a, a extremely high likelihood of an Indonesian climber going to the Olympics, which would be dope as hell. But if she yeah. has to qualify through Asia, I think her chances would be way down. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look this up. We should while we're here. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to look for this. Are we going to look on the the Pan American site or something? Anyway, well, there's a here, here we go. The um, Continental Council's page of the IFSC should list. Nice. I think it would list who Asia Council. Here we go. Um, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, Indonesia, oh, shit. Nepal, Iran, Iran, um, China, South Korea, yeah. Asia. Yeah. That's gonna be so stacked. Uh, yeah. God wow. damn. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, for a second, it, it looks good for Indonesia, but it doesn't anymore. Oh, well. Whatever. Well, it's uh, yeah, it's it's going to be so fun to see yeah. what happens there. Uh, but it, but the point was great to see Jain back on the World Cup circuit. Um, one can only hope that she she continues to to kind of um, recover and, mm -hmm. and get higher in the standings, because it's it's just frankly, it's really weird not seeing Jain in the finals when she's when sure. She's, and again, one of the most legendary lead climbers ever, for sure, like absolutely in the top five. Again, her era of dominance, her going back and forth between her and Mina Varkovic is like unreal. So how cool would that be if you have somebody with the lineage going back, you know, six years into her peak and then 10 years and even further for when she was like competing? That would be uh, that would be pretty uh, that would be some really cool stuff for Olympic B-roll is, is telling those stories. If somebody like that makes it to a final, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and, and it's always f I, I I have this kind of soft spot for the climbers, the competitors that make the Olympics that were part of the circuit back before the Olympics. Yeah, sure. And like yeah. <laughs> even uh, on the, the ones that were like trying to make the Olympics happen, you know, the ones that yeah. were part of that movement. Yeah, not these absolutely. like new damn kids just coming in here and just taking all of our attention after we yeah, built this world for them. 16 year olds, 17 year olds, yeah. it, 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 people like Sean kids. McCall and Akio and, and, you know, all these people that were on it yeah. way before, way before. It's always funny because all of these, uh, in, at least in the United States, you know, the Olympics and, and these competitors are rightly so getting a lot of attention from these mainstream sports outlets like Sports Illustrated, ESPN, all these things. And it's just kind of interesting that, you know, 10 years ago, these these outlets would have never thought to cover competition climbing so um i want to talk about the wall at some point but while we're talking about this I, it's just because we might as well talk about it in terms of the attention that climbers are getting is there a climber with a brand that you think is like cool enough that they could actually do retail stuff and it would be successful because the one thing i have is like i don't think competition climbing is like cool among climbers are, are you talking like Com who's competitors like, or like climbers because I could I, I'm my like first I'm not I'm not gonna climbers. wear a Sean McCall branded shirt right mm -hmm. like that's that's not something I would well I honestly I probably would just to like support the idea of it um, but I'm, if I'm trying to think of like climbers that I think are like cool and people that um, kind of have a really cool image in my and this is gonna sound so stupid because some of these guys are huge nerds. Um, but I like, I like people like Jimmy Webb, who is, is mm -hmm. kind you kind of think of as that guy that just doesn't give a shit and just wants to climb hard pebbles. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if, like, I don't know, is, is Chris Sharma well, like cool anymore? I know he's got the Prana thing. Like is Ashima cool? Are these people that you'd want to have like a streetwear brand created so under? Things. First of all, the, the the person that comes to my mind first is Alex Honnold, um, although he is not a competitor. So I don't know if, if you're talking only. Yeah, I want to talk competitors. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. I, I wanted to like in the, in kind of comparing it to a Tiger Woods kind of thing, right? Where sure. you've got a line of, you know, all the gear, all the clothes and stuff. Well, the Chris Sharma is interesting because I've always I don't have an answer. I've always wondered in terms of his brand in North America. Does the fact that he lives in Europe, does that help 
or hinder his his brand here because i could i can see it on the one hand you could say he's not here to actually um like actively promote any any self brand but on the other hand i think the fact that he lives over in europe kind of helps his legend in north america just kind of like grow he's almost like this mythical figure sure. because you don't see him popping up that often in like american gyms and stuff yeah. you know um so i don't know i he's he, I've, I've thought about that question from time to time is is the fact that sharma has has uh, basically just you know become european right like that's where he's raising his family and that's he has businesses mm -hmm. over there and stuff um it, does that help or hurt his his sharma the sharma brand in north america i don't know um but to your other question uh, competitors, I know like, for example, like Megan Martin came out with a, a, a some t-shirts, uh, just about a month or two ago and, and, oh, cool. and she sold them on her website. Um, was that was as a of, fundraising thing or was that just like, a just like, I don't, a, I don't know. I, I don't know what it was for, but I know that they were, she showed them on Instagram and there were a lot of positive comments and, and, and I, I think they sold out. Um, I don't know how big the run was of them, but I also think that part of that might be because of her American Ninja Warrior yeah. fame as opposed to just her competition climbing fame. Um, it'll be interesting to see if 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 and how Brooke Rabatou's brand grows as the Olympics approach, because I know she's getting profiled by a lot of those outlets that we just talked about, like Sports Illustrated and ESPN, kind of these mainstream, quote unquote, sports outlets. Um but in other competitors that could could start a brand right now, hmm. Um, I just don't maybe, know. If it's maybe there. Adam Andra, I suppose. You know, like I could see maybe people wearing an Adam Andra. Because I think my thing is like, who are the like who? So within each like climbing community, and I guess we'll because we're talking comp climbing, we'll talk about like within a gym, right? Who are the coolest people in a gym? Um, I feel like in a lot of gyms the people that most people look up to are the root setters um, because the job is sick and they're usually strong and they get to do, you know, the stuff that everybody wants to do. And they're kind of, they have like this God complex because they, you know, put stuff up on the walls that you either succeed or fail on. So like, who are the, who are the people that root setters would get psyched behind? And I feel like root setters, a lot of them are, are fairly like cynical and they've been in the industry a little too long. Um, I don't know who are like, who are the brands that those, those like, cool people in the community would wear. And I'm not sure many of the comp climbers would fit that mold um, because I feel like you need that kind of support for the other people in the community to also get behind them. Um, yeah, Cause I can, I can imagine a random scrub, like a new person to climbing in it for a couple months goes to their local shoe retailer, shoe retailer. They see an Andre branded shoe and Andre branded shirt and they buy that stuff. But I don't know if you like end up getting made fun of or whatever after that for like being too keen or some shit. I don't know. Yeah, and this is where like competitors, the the communal nature of the comp scene. It's almost like I feel like to to how to explain this. I think to to make a name for yourself, you almost have to have, or it helps to have. It can help to have this kind of out front personality, mm -hmm. um, and that's just not the type of personality that we see in a lot of these competitors, at least outwardly. Um, they're a lot of them are very shy and certainly very very cordial and friendly, and they're not really ever going to say anything that makes headlines or draws attention beyond the actual like results of these competitions. Um, sure. So it's going to be hard to kind of break into that into that scene of people that 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 are at the gym but might not be familiar with the comp scene, which is really what you would need to do to to start a brand, right? You'd need to you'd need to cross over so you're not just in this comp sphere, but you're also crossing into the you're gathering fans that are just fans of climbing in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and maybe drawing them into the comp scene. Um, Actually, I, I'm just thinking right now, I would buy, and maybe it's just because I'm not a teenager anymore and I still want to like feel young or whatever, I would buy Alberto Jiménez Lopez stuff for sure. I'm, well, I would, I'm already on board with that. I, would I don't think I've ever this. heard the guy I mean, speak ever, but I'm I'm down. I would love to see this. I mean, it's been something that I – it can only help the sport. More, mer more merchandise is going to get more eyes on these competitors and more attention to it. I think it would be awesome. I don't know if we're at the place now where it, it – it could happen, but at the same time, how do we know? Because these men, these these brands that that sponsor these people haven't ever really 
taking a chance and and putting their put their their likeness on it is like a huge stuff. investment to to dedicate a line to to a person like that is that is a lot of resources so i can imagine that you you want to make sure that you're confident that that stuff will move but yeah anyway i'm going to go down to like but, the, the custom shirt place i'm just going to pick a picture off of his uh, instagram and just like heat press it onto a t-shirt and then well that's what uh, now shout out to get Tyson in trouble Shane. for stealing his likeness Coach Tyson Shaney has done that where he puts some um, Ameri- you know, as supportive kind of he put he'll put the uh, likenesses or just photos basically of um, yeah. competitors onto shirts nice. and stuff. It's really Solid. it's really cool. I dig that. Uh, I saw on his Instagram like some little kid running around in one of his gyms with like an old uh, I can't remember which athlete it was, but like with a jersey from one of the old vertical world kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that was cool. It might have been like an Alex Fritz jersey. I can't remember, but uh, yeah, that was kind of cool. Anyway. That- yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I wish that these brands would just try it out because let's give their these brands, their marketing department some credit, too. I mean, even if people don't necessarily know these competitors that well, mm-hmm. if they're marketed right, if they're if their gear is marketed right, then then I think that could go a long way. So um, it, it'd be great to see. I'd love it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would love if I would go to the gym and see people wearing Alex Puccio T-shirts and and, you know, Yanya Garnbrit T-shirts and all this stuff. Yeah. Maybe someday. Actually, you know, I was going to talk about the wall, but I, I want to ask another question. Yeah. Which climbers do you, are there any climbers you think of that have um, like a very well-defined identity as like a person where you're like, this guy is this person and like you are this kind like Jason Kale back in his comp days, the goth guy with the ridiculous dreads, the skullet kind of thing. He's got the contacts like blacking out his irises. Guy's a freak. But that's like who he is on the comp season, comp scene, mm-hmm. right? So he has a, a yeah. really clear identity. And those are the kind of people you attract to, right? So I think that the two things that people are attracted to are like incredible success, which very few climbers have, right? Yanya Garnbrett and Adam Andra are probably the only two right now where you have like very consistent results over a long period of time. Um, or um, personality. And I think that's something, and again, possibly because there's a language barrier that stops so much of, uh, you know, us English watchers to really get to know people. Um, But who are the climbers that have personality? And the thing I'm most psyched about, about this Alberto guy is that it seems like he has personality, whereas Mm -hmm. I don't get to see that with most climbers. Sean McCall, in my opinion, doesn't present much of a personality. and so I think that's the thing I'm looking for. Yeah. That's the thing that uh, like a Sean Rabbitu is very strong at, right? He walks out into into um, preview with like hood over his head, just being like the dirtbag, you know, isolated kid. That's an identity by itself, right? And I, I feel like a lot mm-hmm. of the climbers don't have that kind of strength of personality presented when they climb. Yeah, I I, I would say he's Daniel Woods, no longer on the competition circuit, mm-hmm. but it seems like he's very authentic in, in terms sure. of from what I can can detect um what you see is kind of what you see in interviews and and what you see on the wall is is just sort of a direct reflection of who he is there's really no um kind of pr spin that he's doing himself right. to that um i would say also like it seems like sean bailey a little bit and it's interesting you mentioned yeah, like sean totally. rabbit too because sean oh bailey, sean bailey's the kid i was thinking of with the hood over his head sorry yeah. but yeah they're very similar yeah he comes he comes out to to when he's doing the previews he just comes out in the hood and he always looks really chill um and and he's also very open on instagram as we've said with his kind of celebrations and also his his frustrations and and so he seems like he um he he's very authentic um, in terms of other people, maybe like a Yannick Floe, right? With the he's the the big mohawk. Is he the the competitor that has? Um, I, I always think of Sebastian Helenka. I think that's the that's guy what I'm thinking, you're thinking of. of. German, he didn't yeah, do well this thinking. weekend. He got wrecked okay. in semis, right? Is that the yeah. guy you're thinking of? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, he's uh, a, actually he's he's kind of one of those people. I don't know him super well, but his 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 uh like his visual appearance obviously is like pretty strong. Yeah, um, which which helps, right? If you're if mm-hmm. in terms of branding yourself, if you just yeah. kind of stand out for whatever reason, um, if people can identify you just by looking at you, um, so yeah. But you, to your point, it's there are there are not a lot of them, um, and maybe that's you could say that about any sport. That's why somebody's special when they come along. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, interesting to think about. Yeah, totally. Anyway, the last thing I really wanted to talk about was the wall itself. Um, it seemed to be yeah. one thing that 
came up, uh, especially in Root Setters Anonymous and, and a few other places talking about whether it was a good way of presenting climbing to the world. Um, so there's a bunch of things. First of all, it's a very experienced venue. And so why would you turn down a World Cup to a place that knows what they're doing? They pull it off all the time. They can clearly make the financial side work if they've been doing it for like over, like what, over 20 years? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think it's kind of crazy. Like ninety six. Yeah, it might um, not. Have, it may not have been the same wall that entire time, but looking at the wall, it certainly could be yeah, possibly. It looks like. Um, it. Uh, yeah. So why would you say no to that? Right? They know what they're doing, and it's not easy to get World Cup hosts uh, at all, let alone ones that know what's going on. Um, it's in a great part of the world in terms of it's in a country with a swelling and very hot climber uh, base and they've got um, people out of their country that are doing really well. So that's another huge advantage for it. So hosting it there makes sense. Now the wall, um, do you find like the wall takes away from from the experience or do you think it, it might uh, sour new spectators idea of what comp climbing is? I I don't I think that's two separate questions because I think to to me personally it, give me two it separate answers away. then it it yeah. did not take away from it I, sure. I I loved having it there I think it's a really cool old school wall um, although trying to to slip into the like a new viewer um, it is kind of sh it does look old right it's kind yeah. of shocking when you're you're tuning in you're expecting um, I don't know just like flat um sheer panels um and and dual text holds and stuff and you it's like you have this <laughs> this kind of beige monolithic thing yeah. that um it kind of just reminds you of yeah if you if anybody has ever gone into like like in a lot of cities there will be like the new gym and then there's like the old gym right yeah. and so watching this you're definitely like wow this is like going into the old the old gym yeah um but if if that was anybody's impression, I think once you started watching, you would think that it's really it was really cool because there were some angles that this wall just felt like they were just kind of like snaking over these various overhangs and roof sections. Uh, it's, it, like in the men's final, there was that whole section with the eggs at the, the overhanging eggs at the yeah. top. You were just they were like traversing, hanging. Yeah, I don't really like call that. I don't like calling those things eggs unless they're yellow and white. Like the yellow and white thing, I understood why people were calling them eggs, but they're not yeah. fucking called eggs. That just it looks <laughs> like an egg if it's yellow and white. Not if it's black and white. They're I can't remember the company, but they're called uh, Iso hips or Iso hips or whatever. Yeah. That's the anyway. The egg thing doesn't work for me, black and white. But whatever, fine. But I I feel like that's a that's a a structural feature now i know the the volumes were those aren't part of the mm -hmm. wall but just at, the fact that you would have this like long overhang where the th competitors would just like traverse kind of hang upside down and you kind of would see that back in competitions in the 90s and you don't really yes. see that in, in these <laughs> in these modern like, like i remember if you watch if you would watch old competitions and the camera would get really tight on the competitors yeah and they would be on these roofs you're kind of like you would look like where are they on the wall because yeah, they, sure. like, you would want them to pan out and be like show me where this overhang section is yeah it, you kind of got that impression here um but i think it's that's what we want on the world cup circuit we want all of these walls to have personality and identity and to be distinctive yes and, and visibly as well as kind of structurally uh different from each other totally. and and so that's why i think it's important to keep this one on the circuit not that i don't think there's any talk of taking it off the circuit i don't know but um it's just great to still have it after all these years to still I have this com part completely agree with that i think it's not a great viewing experience for somebody new because it does look old and especially if you've seen new walls you then see this and you're like oh this is kind of crap but i completely agree that the circuit needs to have um it kind of distinguishing features between each stop i want it to get to the point where this place is known to be the benefit of this climbers other climbers are better at this place these are the differences and i want that whole circuit to kind of Tell, tell a story and have individual stops. I think you're bang on with that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't think it's visually that impressive. Um, I think that's fair. I don't think it makes it look that good. And especially if you come in and you see that wall and then you see that women's final where the climbing wasn't that great. A combination of the climbing and the root setting didn't get very far. Meh, kind of like not perfect. It does look kind of amateur. They get to the top of the wall and they're switching to like handheld camcorders by a guy like standing in the rafters trying to shoot at a mandra. Like, yeah, that's not ideal i think that's totally fair um but like let's let's say that wall is 20 years old let's kind of just assume that that is the case at some point you have to replace it um i would get rid of 
wall areas that are hard to view for sure like that's not something there's any there's no good reason for that aside from wanting extra height so hopefully they can remove that part i hope they can make it look clean and modern in terms of the color and the visual impact and all that stuff but honestly if the root setters are cool with it and those root setters have been setting that thing for a while and they seem to be okay with it i hope they keep some of that those goofy very extreme 90 degree angles that you like don't see anymore right i want to see some yeah. severe rope wear in the, yes. in the corners right that's the that's the the hallmark of a really good climbing wall is just fucking yeah. rope grooves in those uh, corners <laughs> it, uh, it almost yeah. reminded me of like in baseball you know there are all these new corporate corporatized stadiums and yet you have like Wrigley Field or, you know, you sure. had, you know, you have all these like every uh, you have a couple of of you had Yankee Stadium before, it, you know, y you had you had these kind of old school mm -hmm. venues and they didn't look as cool or as new as the swanky places, but there was just character to them. Mm -hmm. um, and there was history sure. to them. I think that that's kind of similar to this to this wall. And if they do change it at someday, if they it, someday, if they have to replace the you know the wall and and modernize it or whatever i do hope they keep some of the some of the stylistic uh characteristics of this wall if yeah. nothing else it'd be cool if they would take like one of the panels and like put it at the very top of it sure, yeah. you know, keep one of the old <laughs> yeah totally panels just yeah, for, yeah. Uh, just kind of for history yeah but um i love I, yeah i i don't have any problem with the the wall i think it's great to have on the circuit probably not the best visually to the new viewer, not the best for camera angles, but uh, but it's got character. Yeah, know? I like it a lot. Yeah. yeah. All in all, um, again, like if we're talking about grading this thing, this is a tough one because the feeling you're left with at the end of the comp was awesome. Like a standing ovation, best climber in the world, takes a win with a top and the final climb. It doesn't get better than that. Um, it wasn't great early on, so it's really hard to say. And this is one of those things where coming out of it at the end of the comp, I was genuinely smiling with that kind of like laugh of like, ha this is so amazing. I can't stop myself. Um, so I probably would have graded it somewhere close to like an A or an A+. Um, I, for the women's climb, because that kind of stunk in, in my opinion, I didn't enjoy watching it. And again, I had to take these screenshots that I showed earlier. I had to look at them that way for me to understand exactly how it all worked out because in the broadcast you don't have time to look back at that especially when you don't have control of the replays which would have been really nice in a situation like that at the end of the climb when they had time in the turnover how great would it have been if you could have had those clips side by side saying this is why this person got this this is why this person got this that would have been such a strong feature so i don't know i'm like i'm wavering around b plus a minus because of of that let's say an a minus because i just felt so happy at the end of it um but yeah what yeah. about you I, it would have been an A or an A plus if not for the the bottleneck of the women of uh, the women's finals. I think probably I'll say an A minus as well. I think the 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 thing that was nice about that the not necessarily the bottleneck but that route setting was that um, you have this very specific um, anecdote with like the point five uh, point right like sure. it's like that is kind of like you come away from this comp as that being the thing this 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 deep dive analysis of the 0.5. Uh, w w and it kind of reminds me how the Marion bouldering comp, the, the big anecdote was like the crack climb, right? So it's like yes. always neat when you come away from these competitions with like these, these singular specific anecdotes. Um, and it, and it was something that we hadn't just like, we hadn't seen that crack climb in a boulder in a long time. We hadn't really had a discussion of this 0.5 scoring thing in a long time. So, um, so that was kind of cool. It was unfortunate that it, there was just such a bottleneck for the women there. But, um, so yeah, a minus, it, it, it was nice that, uh, the men kind of offset all that because the men's final yes. was just, uh, it was so yeah. exciting storybook Ho with hopefully hopefully the there. women's finish wasn't so bad that you turned off the tv hopefully yeah. you stuck through that part because it got better at the end yeah if uh, you did you missed you missed one heck of an exciting uh men's final so yeah so anyway uh that's it for cron crange crange how i think they said cran or cron i think the j is sure. silent right that's it know. from the world cup from slovenia crange. Um, yeah, so three weeks from now, uh, we start the last two World Cups and they're back to back. We're going to Xiamen in China and then Inzai in Japan. And uh, we're going to decide who the winners of the lead 
uh, World Cup season is. Yanya's still in the running. She could mm-hmm. get two seasons, the only person ever, I think, in one year to win two different disciplines in the in the world uh, in the World Cup season. So she, she better hope because we'll otherwise she's having a. A terrible 2000. Yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> she came second in the world. Shift. God, that was a, a joke. Scrub. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll see you in three weeks uh, in uh, in uh, Shaman. I hope you all do well. Enjoy local season. Locals are back yeah. on the table. Good luck. So good everybody. luck to all your little kitties, everybody. Hope they uh, hope they do well. Anyway, we'll see you in three weeks. Like, comment, subscribe, whatever. Have a good one.